He started to, he started to say something, but I knew it. <laughs> and I don't want to divert from, from anything, but hold on uh, what Deborah was saying about the anchor. I just, uh, and everything going on in the world, I just needed to say that, uh, you know, of course, God is our, our anchor and our refuge, but we still have to have wisdom in, in these days. Like Amen. And even going back to COVID, using wisdom and, and all that. And then even now with the, the regime we have and stuff, we, Kathy and I are, are prepared, not for the for the worst, but just you got to prepare ahead of time. And I, I felt that I had to, to say that just because, you know, with, with food or gas or water or whatever, you never you never know what's what's going to happen. But we, we don't want to be fearful. But we, there again, we, we have to have wisdom and know and, and read what's going on. So I just, I just had to say that uh, with, with the body here, we don't need to be fearful, but we, we need to be wise and, and, you know, medication or whatever like that, because you don't know what's going to happen. And we as Christians need to see this, the times and the seasons, and, and know, and just that's, that's all I got to say. Yeah. Well, that, in fact, that's, a, that's one of the things the Holy Spirit will do for us is show us things to come. Yeah. And, and he'll give us wisdom from above. Yeah which surpasses knowledge from this realm. So, you know, we can't depend on knowledge. Knowledge comes from the mind, but wisdom comes from above. The wisdom that we want is from above, and it will give us that, uh, the understanding on how to live and, and circumvent issues in our lives just by being willing to hear. to be wise and just do that thing, and it doesn't hurt to have extra food and water and medicine. It sure doesn't. I'm Right, Deborah tells you tell, will tell you that I, I never let my let us get below like 30 gallons of water, yeah. you know, 30 gallon you know jugs of water because I don't like the tap water you know to drink, and uh, so yeah I'm anyway, I just to say that. yeah guys, that's good because, yeah I'm, I'm, we're not afraid of anything but we're just being wise sure yeah that's being prepared. being being prepared and not naive about situations he doesn't want us to be naive yeah. you know and, and not we not thoughtful. Also, Yes. I know we've gone through it in World War II, and it was so amazing. We had nothing. I mean, when you bombed out and you were on the streets and you had no shoes and no food and nothing. Right. But the goodness of God, even as a young child, mm -hmm. how God provided. Yes. I keep yeah. thinking back. Amen. Because there was nothing prepared. There was nothing there to prepare. And the goodness of God, how he brought us through and sought us through and always had a meal and always had provision and always sent laborers and there was always a way out. I'm still marvel over it sometimes and I sit and cry and just thank God he'll do it again. You know, Amen. Take care of us. Well, I, I just, yeah. you know, I recall the promise of, that David, when David said, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm young, I'm, I'm old, I was young, and I've never seen the righteous forsaken or their seed, the seed uh, which we are, Christ's seed, yeah. begging for bread. Uh, and, and so there's a faithfulness even when, you know, when things don't look like there's any way. I remember that guy, that, what was the guy that had the orphanage? And he's... Oh. Mueller, George Mueller, he'd sit at the table and you know, they wouldn't have a thing to eat. And he'd set the table and say, everybody sit down and there'd be a knock at the door and he'd go to the door and be four or five sacks of groceries out there, you know, and it's like, so it may not be when you think it should happen, but, but, yeah, but I mean, they, they probably didn't all the time. They did what they could, but then they knew that they could trust and count on the Lord. So that's what you balance, you balance not your wisdom and understanding with with our trust that you know whatever happens he's going to he's going to take care of yeah yeah just the more i will never forget my grandma when people the door and they wanted they didn't put food where we hardly didn't have any way ate bread old bread soup hard bread my mother made soup out of it and my grandma gave the last little stick of butter away and i said to her, why'd you get this last piece of butter what are we going to eat? We don't have any. And she said, 
Just don't worry about it. God will provide. She had faith. She had faith. And probably, there's probably a cow somewhere out there. Too. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah there, is, there you go. All we need is more milk and more and a churn, and we got we got more butter. So, uh, yeah. All right. Well, hallelujah. Well, let's uh, let's go ahead and let's get in let's get in the message this morning. And Lord, we just thank you again for your word. Uh, the entrance of your word brings light, revelation, uh, edification, exhortation, comfort to us. That's how we know it's from you is because it brings that peace that passes all understanding that causes us to guard our heart with that, with that realization that, you, that you've got us. Uh, and we, you've written us, you said you've written us in the palms of your hands. That's what those, those nails, nail marks are there for. And so, Lord, we thank you for the word today. Uh, and we, in Jesus' name, amen. amen. And let's see. Good morning. Sounds, sound is good, right? Yep, sound is good. Thank you, Lana. My, tech, my sound technician in Tennessee. Uh, this is part two, uh, and I didn't put talk part two in the title because there's one word difference in the title from this week versus last week. Um, and you'll see as we go along here, uh, just a couple of things when we get started. I know with a couple of people we, we may have, we had, I threw so much at you last week, so many details about things that, were, were exciting to me because it shows that God knows the end from the beginning. And he spoke things that there was no question when he spoke them that they were going to come to pass. And we could trust and relate to that and understand what the sure word of prophecy is. And that's anything that, that, the, that God has, has said and that he... Um, even from the beginning of when man, the fall in the garden, God, already, God was not taken off guard. He wasn't taken off guard. There was already a pre-arranged fix for the issue. And that was the first thing he said. See, the enemy, the devil thought he won uh, in that moment for about two seconds. You know? um, and then the rut row comes because then the seed, the, the promise of the seed came to pass. I, Two years ago, I preached a little bit on this, and I don't know if y'all remember this this image that we did. Um, it, it, this is Eve. This is uh, Eve on the this side, and that's Mary on this side. And the and I've got at the bottom. This was last week. We talked about Genesis three, where it said that her seed was going to uh, bruise uh, the serpent's head. Um, and you can see the serpent is actually wrapped around her leg, but the head is under the foot of Mary over there because she's carrying the seed which is Christ. So the promise made, the prophecy made to her, and I've got Galatians 4 down here at the bottom because in the fullness of time, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman. And I could go there for about two days because one of my favorite college courses was embryology. And you'll see that the man, the man that, all the blood in the em embryo is, is, is through the man. None of it is through the woman. Uh, and you, if you think about that for a minute, you know, that, that's why it had to happen this way. Uh, it had to be the seed of the woman because everything that the male seed through Adam was defiled. And so anyway, I could go there for, for quite a while. But anyway, I wanted you to see that just, to, just as a recognition of what we were trying to show last week is, the, is following the seed. We followed the seed through all of the generations, through, through Noah, through Abraham, and then even knew through Jacob. Jacob actually had the word of the Lord toward his seven, his twelve sons, and he just he already knew which two were going to be coming back from the promised land with a good report, and he prophesied it before it happened because that's the way God is. He can tell us uh, what's going to happen in our lives. See, we know the end of the story now, and history is His story, and now we know the end of the story is that we win in Christ. We have, we, we have our inheritance is God himself. We, have, we are, uh, because of Christ and that seed that we belong to now because of the gospel, uh, which is the goat of what you'll find today is the glory of God. That seed is the reason why we, the promise is secure. Um, we are Christ, if, we're, if we're in Christ, there are Abraham's seed and an heir according to the promise. An heir of God himself, Romans chapter 8. Everything that God is and everything that He has, He's given to us through the seed, through the promise, which is the glory of God 
And Christ in us is the hope of that glory. And it's being further and further realized by the declaration, the prophetic declaration of the gospel. Amen? The promise is secure. And so we declare, we continue to declare that. So anyway, this was about two years ago, if you want to go back. I could post it again this week. And uh, I have one other thing before we get going here is that about Tuesday or Wednesday, this, I heard a song. Uh, Deborah says that, that Samuel may have sung part of it in his, one of his messages. Uh, my brother, my pastor friend, Samuel in California. Uh, but it, I didn't remember if he did. I didn't remember it uh, specifically. But uh, I haven't heard this song since 1968. And we sang, uh, the, uh, to my knowledge, I know Deborah said that maybe Samuel did. And Samuel, I'm sorry if I wasn't listening clearly at the time. <laughs> uh, but uh, it was, uh, what I heard was, uh, there, there to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to His name. Y'all remember that song? I don't know if you remember that song. Uh, glory to His name. Glory. I'm singing it off, but there, uh, there to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to His name. And then I so I found the song, and the lyrics are just amazing, just amazing. Jesus so sweetly abides within. There at the cross where He took me in. Glory to His name. O oh, precious fountain that saves from sin, I'm so glad I have entered in. There Jesus saves, and saves me and keeps me clean. Glory to His name. And what's interesting is that I didn't understand what I was singing then. But by the Spirit now, this week when He brought it back to me, I, now, now the song I understand because the lyrics are the gospel. And, and we have a promise. I wrote it down here after I saw that. There's a promise... Uh, In uh, John, John chapter 14, verse 26, that he said, When the Spirit comes, the Holy Spirit comes, He will bring to your remembrance everything that I've spoken to you. So anything that you've heard that's, that's concerning Jesus, concerning the, the, the finished work of Christ, anything that you've heard, that's why it's, it's faith comes by hearing. So it's important what we hear. Amen? It's important what you're hearing because he has made a promise that uh, by, by the Holy Spirit, what he spoke here in John chapter 14, is that anything that you've heard uh, out of your, in your hearing that's about uh, Jesus and the finished work, he will bring that, hey, good morning, he will bring that to your, your remembrance, no matter when you heard it or how long ago you heard it. Because that's what the Holy Spirit's confirming, uh, and He wants to make it clear to you. Like for me, it was a, it was a, it was a, uh, it was something so amazing that even back in 1968, it was still it was there. Even though I was, I'm just now realizing the the fullness of what it means. But He said because that was about Him, He brought it to the, my remembrance. Amen. So uh, we're going to talk about, we're going to continue with, uh, there's, like we said last week, there's three places. I always thought it was just one. But uh, the, the prophecy that the earth shall be filled uh, with the glory of God, that's the way God said it first in, in Numbers. He declared uh, that, that the earth was going to be filled with the glory of God, but he didn't specify anything else about it. All he knew was that he was frustrated with the fact that man, apart from the Holy Spirit, has no ability to enter in to the promised land, which ultimately was going to be Christ himself. He's, he's our, our promised land is to be in Christ. Their promised land was across the Jordan. We descend, that word Jordan means to descend. Jesus descended down into the, uh, to death and came out on the other side, and we're following him through. So all that was a type and shadow of what we're the true experience that God was, God spoke of in the garden and was bringing to pass. But he was frustrated because he knew it couldn't happen until the seed came to which the promise was made, and that was Jesus. So there was a frustration, but he still declared it was going to happen. The earth is going to be filled with the glory of the Lord. So uh, the second place it's written in Scripture is actually in the first section of your notes today. Um, it's Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 14. 
Uh, and notice the title of the message today is The Glory of Our Lord. So we're going to see today there's a transition between the glory of the Lord and the glory being personal. Amen? It's ours. Uh, and you'll see by the time we get through here what I'm talking about. So I just put it in, rather than have us go and read out of the Old Testament, most of us are carrying the, the Passion Translation, which uh, it's hard for me to go uh, sometimes back. I, I didn't bring my Amplified today, but I wrote it in the Amplified in your notes. Behold, it, is it not by appointment of the Lord of hosts that the nations toil? And, and y'all were talking about this both in your, in your singing and what Deborah was saying. Um, that the nations toil only to satisfy the fire that will consume their work. And the peoples weary themselves only for emptiness, falsity, and futility. See, that's the way the world system, uh, I don't care how much you, how much you, you know, you, we can thirst after things. And I'm gonna, I'm, we're going to go to it here in just a minute. But uh, Jesus uh, made a declaration on the Feast of Tabernacles that he went to on the last, he went to on the last day. This is in John chapter seven. He, on the last day of the feast, he came and said, "If any man thirst, let him come to me and drink." Because see, he brings the satisfaction that doesn't come by what the world has to offer. The world is looking for satisfaction in whatever it is, ABCs, and that was what that's what we traded in the Garden of Eden. We traded the tree of knowledge, the tree of life, for the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So here we're trying to, we're looking at a tree and trying to do good and not do bad in a sense of, of, of defining our, our, in our identity and our ability to be like God apart from Him. And that's the lie of the tree of knowledge of good and evil is that we can't be, uh, being separated from, from Him, we cannot be, uh, become like Him or be, uh, as long as we're eating from the wrong tree. Uh, and I... I ate from the the right side of the wrong tree for 40 years in my life, my, my Christian life, because I thought that's what God was interested in, was for me to eat and, and do good and try to please Him so that I could be accepted. If that was possible, then Jesus, like what Paul said in Galatians, then, then he, he died in vain. Jesus went to the cross for no purpose because it would have been possible for us to do it. Amen? So that was the reason for the cross. Uh, so... That first part of that verse uh, in Habakkuk 2.14 there is the, the life under the, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. I don't care how much you gain. Jesus said, if, what does it profit if you gain the whole world but you lose your own soul because you're trying to gain something that you can never gain. And there's never any true, permanent, lasting fulfillment and happiness in life in, in, in what we attain or what we do here. That's why, you know, if, if, if it was, Hollywood should be the most happy, fulfilled people in the, in the country, right? Uh, but they're the mo some of the most miserable because they haven't, they haven't seen the, the emptiness, and that's what he's trying to say. Uh, all that is going to be consumed, all that striving for what you can get out of this world system. It's all empty, and that's what Solomon, the wisest man in the Bible, said in Ecclesiastes, it's all futility, striving for the wind. It will never satisfy. But there's one thing that will, and that's Jesus. And that's why he said that on the last day of the feast. If anyone thirsts, because then he said, I'll give you a well inside you that'll come that the, where the living water, he was talking about the Holy Spirit, will give you life and give others life through you. See, that's the dual purpose of the Holy Spirit abiding in us, is to give us life give us life more abundantly, and then give life to others through us as the Holy Spirit flows out of us. Amen? Amen? So the second part, so, so the second part of that scripture in Habakkuk is, uh, but, and I love the fact that he put the but there, that's, that all this futility and striving, he said that's, in a, that's coming to a full end. That's coming to an end. Uh, the time is coming when the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. So uh, the first prophecy in Numbers is now being replaced with now there's knowledge going forth, prophetically the knowledge of the glory uh, uh, as the waters cover the sea. And I think it's interesting today that the gospel uh, through the airwaves, through the internet, through whatever, it's covering the earth as the waters cover the sea in it. So the knowledge is there of the glory of the Lord and, we're, and it's the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's the gospel 
Uh, and that's why in, in, in uh, Isaiah, Isaiah 53, 1, it says, Who has believed our report? To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? See, the first half of Habakkuk 2, 4 is the arm of the flesh. It can't achieve enough to, to be self-fulfilling. So, um, the, the, it took the arm of the Lord to bring us into a place of fulfillment. It took His work on our behalf, in other words. I can't, make, I can't do enough work to make God happy. So God says, well, I don't want you to try. That was the, that was the lie and the mistake in the beginning. What, I, what I'm doing is sending a Savior that's going to come as your substitute, do the work for you, and then give you rest in His work so that you don't have to strive anymore. And then on top of that, I'm going to give you His same Spirit that's in Him. I'm going to put it in you. And then all the work that's going to come out of you is simply fruit of the Spirit, not, no longer works of the flesh. And see, so you will enter into His rest and cease from your own works the same way He did because eventually Jesus accomplished all of the fin He finished it. In fact, the last thing He said from the cross was what? Yeah, to telestai, that's the, that's the word in, in Aramaic, to telestai. It's done. He said, it's finished my bride. That's how he finished it. And so he sat down, right? He wasn't tired. He was finished. Redeeming us. So the, so the, pro, the, the, the work was done to give us full satisfaction, to fulfill our thirst, to bring us the Holy Spirit, the gift of the Holy Spirit, so that we could be... Um, be brought into to the family of God. Amen? So knowledge of the arm of the Lord is the knowledge of His own arm bringing forth our salvation. Amen? So, and then Isaiah 53 verse 1 says, Who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? We're going to look at this in John here in just a minute. Uh, in fact, let's go there because we can read in John 12 and then look at your notes for the other, the other prophecy in Isaiah. John chapter 12. John chapter 12. So again, somebody tell me real quick just so I know you understand what I'm saying. What is the arm of the Lord? It's what He did in our place that we couldn't do. That's, that's why if, if we had the strength and the arm to do it, He wouldn't have had to come do it. Amen? He saw the futility, the emptiness, the, vain, the vainness of man's attempt in the strength, of the strength of the flesh to accomplish what could not be accomplished through our striving because we were separated from the power source. Uh, and that was the fall, that was the, fall, the, the, the separation that happened uh, in the Garden of Eden. But thank God He spoke right away to the woman and gave the promise of the seed, which is Christ. Amen? So no, through no generation has there not been access to the promise of the seed from the very get-go. Every, every generation every, uh, has had access to the gospel. It says in, in Hebrews 11, Abel was the first one declared righteous because he knew the sacrifice was not going to come through, through him, but through the lamb, the lamb that he offered to God in his place. Amen. The lamb was offered in our place. So when God today looks at, he's not looking at you, he's looking at the lamb. What had to be spotless? You were the lamb. Why? Because that was what caused your redemption. It was depending upon the sacrifice, not you. And so you would go away clean because the sacrifice gave up his life in your place. That's why all those sheeps were, you know, through the years, it was all pointing to the, to the Lamb of God that John says was going to take away the sin of the world. Amen? Now, uh, so, um, in John chapter 12, I want, to, I want to back up just a little bit from verse 41. Uh, verse, go to verse 27. Even though I am torn within and my soul is in turmoil, I will, this is Jesus talking, I will not ask the Father to rescue me from this hour of trial. For I have come to fulfill my purpose, which is, after the dash, to offer myself to God. 
Uh, so, Father, bring glory to your name. And boom, suddenly there was a sonic boom of the voice of God that says, uh, I have glorified my name and I will glorify it through you again. So the, the, the way that God's, God could be uh, glorified was through what the Son was doing uh, by divine purpose of God. God sent Him on a divine mission because we couldn't save ourselves. He was on a divine mission. That was the will of the Father, Ephesians chapter 1. Remember the WWW spiritually? What is it? The, the, will the will of the Father was for us to become His sons. Right? Through the work of the Son. And now the witness of the Spirit is for us to believe and receive what the Father willed and what the, the Jesus worked to give us. It's pretty good news if you just get right down to it, isn't it? He did all the work. And it was because the Father willed it to be so, so that we could inherit it all. Uh, probably shouldn't use the same illustration again, but I will. It's like, the, it's like the boxer in the ring. He gets in the ring and knocks it out, and he gets the prize, and he takes it home to his wife. He's, a, he's an overcomer, but she's more than a conqueror. The wife is more than a conqueror because she got everything that he fought for. Uh, and he just, he was, she was just rooting for him. <laughs> he was the one that, was, that got in the ring and won. Jesus won our battle with the enemy. And that's what he's saying right here. Mm -hmm. The audible voice of God startled the crowd. Then Jesus told them, The voice you heard was not for my benefit, but for yours to help you believe. From this moment on, everything in this world is about to change. Does that sound like Habakkuk, the verse in Habakkuk? Mm -hmm. Everything is about to change, for the ruler of this dark world will be overthrown. Uh, if you look at the footnote, this the hinge of history was the cross. And that's what the promise that was so needful for, us, for them looking forward and for us looking back, the promise is how we, our soul stays anchored to the hope of what Christ accomplished for those born before Him and for those born after. We're just looking back in history now. But this was the hinge of history that made, that made it that solidified and it says that if the enemy had known what was going to happen here, he would never have allowed Jesus to be crucified because he was shooting himself in the foot. And that's why, that's why the serpent's head is crushed. I love that, movie, that part of the movie. His head is crushed by Jesus. But it says bruise. And I want to, I want to, I want to, next week I'm going to, we're going to show what God decided to do through the body of Christ to fulfill the rest of that concerning the serpent, uh, the serpent's uh, demise. Amen. In our through the church, through us, we'll we'll talk about that next week. Now, uh, if you go on down uh, to verse now that's in your notes there, uh, look at verse thirty. Uh, Let's start with third, verse 37. Even with the overwhelming evidence of all the many signs and wonders that Jesus had performed right in front of them. Does that sound familiar? What God did in front of the children of Israel? Yet, uh, His critics still refused to believe. This fulfilled the prophecy given by Isaiah, Lord, who has believed our message? Who has seen the, the unveiling of your great power? His great power is His glory, and His great power is the power of the gospel and what Christ has done to bring us into His family as sons. Uh, that's the glory that we get to, get to share in, and we'll see that in just a minute. And the people were not able to believe, so that, and then he quotes Isaiah. And look at verse 41, because then we're going to go back to the notes. Isaiah uh, chapter 12 verse 40, I mean John chapter 12 verse 41 says, Isaiah said these things because he had seen and what? Experienced. Experienced the splendor, which is another word for glory of Jesus, and prophesied about him. Now in your notes, I have put Isaiah 6, 1 through 3, which is what Isaiah, what Isaiah saw that Jesus is talking about. Yeah, I, have I lost you? No. Yeah. 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 Okay, Jesus uh, is saying 
verse 41. Uh, in fact, the, John is the writer of this gospel. And, and he said, the, thing, the two things we saw, who has believed our report, and God has blinded their eyes so that they couldn't see unless, so that they could, they could turn and instantly be clean, cleansed and healed. Isaiah, then, then John says, Isaiah said these things because he had seen and experienced the splendor of Jesus. And he's seen it. And so if you go back to Isaiah 6, which is what he's quoting here, it's in your notes. You see it in your notes? Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah, the, one of the major prophets, got to see and experience what we have seen and experienced before it happened. Amen? And so what he said, the quote is, in the, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw, that's Isaiah, I saw the Lord, and that's Jesus, sitting. Why was he sitting, by the way? He was finished. Sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe, that's us, by the way, in case, you, in case you want to know, we're, the, we're that robe, the train of the, His robe of righteousness, the body of Christ. You'll see more about that next week. Uh, fill the temple. We are the temple. We are the Holy of Holies. He is inhabiting His church, uh, even on the earth now. Uh, and then it talks about above, uh, it stood the seraphim. It's a, angel, a class of angels, each one having six wings. And they all cried, they cried to one another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. And then what does he say? He got, a, he got a prophetic vision of the whole earth being filled with the glory, which was the prophecy of God in Numbers. Habakkuk prophesied it in 2.14. And now Isaiah is seeing it as manifested, right? Okay. Now, uh, Uzi, Uzi, Uzziah, it says when the year King Uzziah died, if you, Uzi, the first four letters, means um, my strength. And Uzziah, anytime you see an A-H added, like uh, Abram's name was Abram, and then God changed it to Abraham, he gave Abraham his grace. Because the word ah, A-H, is the word hey. So anytime you see an A, Deborah, people used to call her Debbie a lot. I call her Deborah because God gave her grace, even in spite of giving her me, right? <laughs> uh, so she needed the grace. Oh, uh, what are you laughing about, Tom? Uh, but uh, so A-H was added to Uz uh, Uzi's name. And, and so Uzziah means my strength is the Lord. Now that's just not there by accident, folks. I'm sorry. But he got a vision the time when he realized that uh, when Uzziah, see, when we die to self, that's when we gain his death in us. You all see it? Until we die to self, see, we're going to be self-righteous. We're going to be self-effort. Uh, are going to be self-occupied. Go to the bookstore. What's the biggest section of any bookstore today? Self-help. Self -help. Trying, to, trying to figure out how to do it yourself instead of realizing you can't. And then you get to realize, but he did, and now I can rest. And I don't have to worry about fixing myself because he came in by the Holy Spirit and gave me the victory, perfect completion, Forgiveness, holiness, righteousness, the whole show is here. And then now he's trying by the Holy Spirit to convince me in my mind of that reality now. I'm not trying to become holy. He made me holy when he entered into my life. That's the glory of God, and we're going to see that. So that glory that comes in, which is what the gospel is trying to tell us, is Christ in us, the hope of glory. So when Christ comes in, he brings all of his perfection with it. Now, why did Jesus go into the grave? To take all of our bad. Did he have any bad? No. So he didn't take any of his bad there. He took our bad. So when he came out, he could give us his good and make it legal. Because he didn't deserve to die and we don't, deserve to, we don't deserve anything that we've gotten. So that's the way God did it. 
and it's wonderful and to behold in our eyes. I'm getting happy just talking about it. Everybody see this? Um, he prophesied. Isaiah was prophesying. Uh, and so uh, in, uh, I just put this extra verse in here. Where are we on time? Oh, we're still good. Tom, I'll have to fix the clock next week. Uh, Luke 2.14. Notice the 2.14 scriptures that we're going to be talking about today. We, just, we talked about Habakkuk 2.14. Now Luke 2.14, this is the King James, New King James Version. It says, Glory to God in the highest. Remember, who said that? Anybody remember? In, Beth, in Bethlehem? It was the angels bringing the message of the glory of God, which was Jesus Christ coming into the world to give us himself. And see, this was the highest glory of God, was that this plan was coming to pass. The glory to God in the highest was the full, the full expression of his will happening in the earth to bring to pass this glory in our lives. Amen? Amen. And it says, uh, And on earth peace, good will, that's the will of the Father, by the way, good will toward men. God's greatest glory is revealed in Jesus and His, which is the Father's will and purpose to bring us into His family as sons through faith in Jesus. So that's the glory of God and the highest glory that God has is in the completion of this purpose, which was the divine purpose of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit from the very beginning. Amen? Uh, Now, if you haven't been listening or you, if you're kind of sleepy or whatever, turn, let's, let's, this part, get an extra sip of coffee because I want you to let's, go to, let's go to 2 Thessalonians. And I didn't, I, I wish I could say I put this together, but I just listen and, and, he, and all of a sudden these things start coming into my mind, in my heart, I say my mind, but in my heart, that starts linking this stuff together. And I, I, can, I could never put it together like this. So I'm so thankful for the, the divine encourager, the Holy Spirit that's, that's uh, giving us all things. Jesus said when he comes, he's going to take what's mine and he's going to give it to you. That's the Holy Spirit's job today on the earth is to give us everything that Jesus has and everything that He is. He gives us everything that He is instantly when we're born again. But He has to convince us of everything we have now because of Jesus, uh, that we have all of, uh, all of what Jesus has is our inheritance. Everybody see that? So important to understand this. We're not, we're not, we're not striving to gain anything. We're, try, we're striving to, to understand the knowledge of the glory of God. See? The knowledge is... Is it, we're making that evident today. Um, it's about Jesus and what He accomplished, the will of the Father, the work of the Son, and the witness of the Spirit. Is that is that knowledge He's trying to make us understand here what has already happened in us because of Christ in us, the hope of glory. Amen. That is the hope of glory, isn't it? Yes. Colossians says that. Paul said that in Colossians. Okay. Second Thessalonians, uh, we're in chapter 2 here, chapter 2, 214 again, how about that? Another 214. Does you, do you know that to this end, he handpicked you for salvation through the gospel so that you would have, what? The glory of our Lord. The glory of our Lord. The Lord Jesus Christ. Now look at look uh, look under the word right by the word have. I've got the word footnote. If you look at that, if that uh, um, have, look at the look at the footnote. Share in possess the Greek word. Uh, Parapoesis, which means uh, 
an en encompassing, a surrounding, and, or encircling. Believers, look at the, look, this. Believers are brought within the perimeter of the glory of God through Jesus Christ. There is nothing in the context to imply that it's a future event, but rather a present enjoyment and participation in the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? That's what we have is His glory in us. Everything, we're, we're brought in to this uh, promised land, this secret place where we now have the fullness of everything Jesus paid, paid to give us. Amen? And then if you go on just a few words down, it says uh, the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you look at that footnote, uh, and I, I, I didn't, I, I'll be honest with you, I hadn't been paying much attention to Second Thessalonians lately. I hadn't been, read, hadn't been reading. Anybody else been reading Second Thessalonians? Just in your off time this week, have you been, said, you know what, I need to read Second Thessalonians. Anybody had that come up? No. Well, you will now, I promise you. Yeah. Because look at this, the, look at the footnote here where the writer, this, this, uh, this uh, uh, anointed writer of this translation, he knew all the meanings of these Aramaic words, which is what Jesus spoke and the apostles spoke. This is some of the more, most wonderful truths in the New Testament. Read them over and over again slowly and think about all that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit have done for us. And, then, and he lists some of them. Uh, the, all, the, the purpose of our salvation is more than just being set free from guilt. It's also that we would share in and possess the glory of Christ. We're going to look at that here in just a second. Now let's go on uh, to Second Thessalonians uh, 16. The next, the next section of your notes starts with verse 16. Now may the Lord Jesus Christ and our Father God who loved us and in, in His wonderful grace gave us eternal comfort and a beautiful hope that cannot fail. Why is it? Why can't it fail? Yeah, Jesus. If Jesus can fail, it can fail. What do you think the odds of that are? Zero. Zero. Below zero. If it can, if we can get below zero, uh, and that's what encourages our hearts and inspires you with strength to always do and speak what is good and beautiful in His eyes. Now. Look at, that, look at that footnote. The Aramaic actually says in verse 17 that he will make your hearts a well of prophecy. Wow. What is prophecy? What is the spirit of all prophecy? Jesus. The testimony of Jesus. So he will make your hearts a well of prophecy and he will stand you in every word and in every beautiful deed. So it's He that works in us both to will and to do His good pleasure, right? It's His power now doing the good. I'm not trying to do the good and failing. He's doing the good even in, the, in spite of what Dr. Deborah said, what our failures might be. That's not our power source is in my success or failure. It's in His success in spite of my failure. And, and if I keep that on my understanding then my failures will be swallowed up by His victory. If I'm trying to gain the victory myself, I'm going to continually be swallowed up. You remember the, remember the old uh, wild, 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 wide world of sports on Saturdays? The thrill of victory and what? Remember the guys doing, this, doing the jump off, <laughs> crashing? And that's, that's life under striving ourselves. Instead of resting in his work, I'm, I'm uh, we're getting there. Okay, uh, so uh, he will make your hearts a well of of, of uh, prophecy, and he will stand you. He's the one that's our standing. He'll stand us in that word. Remember the chart, the three realms. Yeah. Everything that Jesus, everything that God declares, is starts in the third realm. It's word. And then there's an energy with that it's called a wave in, in the second realm. And then the, in our realm, there's the particle. Uh, it starts with what God says. And we can count on what he, got, what he says to become the reality of, this, of our life here. 
Amen? Uh, now, uh, also, look at, look at chapter 3. Uh, finally, dear brothers and sisters, verse 1, pray for us that the Lord's message will continue to spread rapidly and its glory be recognized. So do you, do you need a definition of what the glory is? Does that define it? The glory to be recognized is then the Lord's message. Now look uh, uh, in, in your uh, chapter 3. Uh, let's see, did I put... Look at, look at the, the, what is good. and uh, We already did that footnote. Okay, that's what the... We, he will make you, uh, your hearts, a well of prophecy. What is that? I mean, that sounds holy, doesn't it? Or something, something kind of sounds holy. But what does that just really mean? Out of your heart will flow rivers of living water, which is the testimony of what Jesus has done for me, for you, for the whole world. Did Jesus come to just save a few people? The Father said it's, He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to the knowledge of the Lord. Uh, so His His desire is what, when we become that well of prophecy, as we declare God's goodness, His will. You know, so many people in church this morning think God's mad. He's glad. It just said we just read that in John chapter, uh, Luke chapter two, right? He sent the angels to say, hey, I'm glad. This is the day. Finally, I don't have to be frustrated anymore like I was back then because this is the day that my will is being established on the earth. Hallelujah. Am I rambling, Mark? Okay. Uh, Mark would know because I've rambled, I've rambled a lot with him. Okay. So that, that verse 3, uh, that chapter 3, verse 1, you know, again, it has to do with John 7. If you want to read this story, John seven thirty seven, it's about the Feast of Tabernacles. His brother said, why don't you go show off in, in Jerusalem? He said, it's not my time. You go ahead. But then he came later, but he came on the last day because he wanted them to all be exhausted with their own thirst quenching. And then he said, now, if you really want to have a quench of your thirst, just come to me. Because I want to give you a well inside that will fill you. It's like the woman at the well. You won't need a bucket anymore because you're going to be the bucket. Amen. You're going to contain the Holy Spirit. And he's going to give life to you and through you. And we get to be giddy and beside ourselves. What's my favorite Greek word now? Exist to me. I'm, and that's that's uh, 2 Corinthians 5. What is it, Deborah? 2 Corinthians 5. I showed it to her yesterday. Huh? Where it says that if, Paul said, if we're beside ourselves with ecstasy, it's for God. Ecstasy, that word ecstasy is exist in me. He exists in me. And if that doesn't give us ecstasy, I don't know what will. He actually exists in me, in you. Hallelujah. Okay. John 17. Anybody know what the Lord's Prayer is? What? Hmm? I would start, you know, years ago I would start quoting Our Father who's yeah. earned in heaven, hallowed be I. Because all that was was His disciples under the law teach, asking Him to teach them to pray under the law. But if you want to get the Lord's Prayer, go to John 17. Because this is where the Lord prayed for us in the Garden of Gethsemane right before he went and finished the work. Uh, look at the, verse, the first verse. Um, this is him praying. This is in the Garden of Gethsemane, which was, it's olive press. Isn't, what, isn't that what Gethsemane means? It was olive press. He was pressed uh, to the point where I can't, we can't even imagine what he was under. The weight of all of our guilt and shame and sin. Father, the time has come. Unveil the glorious splendor, or in other words, uh, glorify your Son so that I will magnify your glory. 
So in glorifying Jesus on the cross, if you look at the footnote there, look, look, how, look how the Father glorified the Son. Footnote on John 17.1. The Father unveiled the glory of His Son on the cross by the empty tomb through His ascension into heaven and the mighty outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon His church. Because see, how do we share in His glory? Co-crucified, co-buried, co-resurrected, co-ascended, co-seated. Hey, that's five. That's, that sounds like grace to me, doesn't it, you? The number, for, number five means grace in Hebrew. So those things are how we share in that glory. Everything that he did now has been accredited in a, and given to our account. Amen? Hallelujah. Uh, now, uh, let's go to, the, go, to, go to verse 22. Got the angels are running around upstairs there. <laughs> Well, you know, the, the angels so, they so rejoice in our salvation. They, you know, Gabriel showed up with Mary to tell her the good news, right? Who was the first person? What happened at the, at the empty tomb? It was the angels visiting with Mary Magdalene about why it was empty. You know, don't, don't, be, don't be looking for the living among the dead. Okay. So verse, where are we at? Verse 22. Uh, for the very glory you have given me, I have given them. <laughs> now that's a pretty good, uh, pretty good verse, I would think. So that they will be joined together as one and what? Experience the same. Uh, same unity that we enjoy. Uh, Isaiah, that verse in the, foot, in the footnote there says... Uh, it is important to note that the key to unity among believers is experiencing the glory of God that Jesus has imparted to us. As one with God through faith in Christ, He shares His glory with us. Since we are not... See, that verse in Isaiah 42 says that my glory I'll not give to another. But guess what? You're not another anymore. You're in, you're in Him. And so He's going to give you that. Y'all okay with that? If he gives it, if he gives you, if he lets you share in his glory, y'all okay with that? How about if you get to share in all of it? Amen. See, that's even better. I hope you're getting a little more. Uh, I, I I took my blue crate, my blue pencil, and I uh, every every time the word experience is in there, which is in several times, three times, just in about five verses there. He doesn't want this to be something that's just written on a page that you read. He wants you, to, he wants you to, to actually be able to experience and live the fullness of this message of His glory in us, Christ in us. He wants it to bring you to a place of like, wow, and live in that wow all the time. That's what He wants for us. Because it's not just something, it's, it's not a story, it's, it's a reality. And the Holy Spirit is, is right now trying to give witness to that in every, every person's heart. Uh, or my mind, I should say. He's trying to renew our minds to what's happened in our heart in the new birth. Uh, okay, verse 23. You live fully in me, and, I, and now I live partially in them. Does it, say, it doesn't say... It says fully... That's even better, isn't it? So that they will perfect unity. And I love the I love the footnote on this one. The Aramaic means to shrink into one. You know, when when we see Jesus in one another, our vaulted opinions of ourselves will shrink. If I think I've achieved something that impresses God, and I've achieved more than you have, then I'm going to think you're here and I'm here. But when we've received all of Him, and, in, and that's the unity of our faith, guess what? I, I, we all shrink into one. There's, no, there's nobody any better, more important, more vital, more uh, holy, more righteous. Do you, did, what righteousness do we have? 
Christ's righteousness. Is there any righteousness of anybody else you might think might be in maybe a little better than that? So, we have no room to boast in ourselves. Our boasting is all in Him and what He's done. Hallelujah. Okay. Uh, but it gets better. And the world will be convinced that you have sent me, for they will see that you love each one of them with the same passionate love that you have for me. That's, that's almost, you know, that's, that's, that's just way up there in a sense of, of euphoria, in a sense of what, that he loves us, that God loves us this with the same passion he loves his own son. In Jesus. And how would you expect that the world would see that? That you know, I looked at that and I, I, I meditated on it until finally I think the Lord gave me an answer. But how will they see that you love that God loves each one of us? The way that we love each other. There you go. In John, First John. That's what he says. This is how they will know is by the love you have for one another. So when, they're not, when we're not treating each other the way the world treats each other, the world's going to see that. And they're going to say, wait a minute. That doesn't seem natural. It isn't. Supernatural. Go ahead, Kim. I was just going to say, when you read it, I, had this, this, I was seeing it like, remember when we were under religion, and they would say to you, before you even had a revelation that God loved you, Go out and show them Jesus. Go out and show them Jesus. You know, yeah, with the frown on your face. And I'm so happy. You didn't show them anything because you didn't have a revelation that you were even loved. Right. Now that we focus on Jesus, we As, see that we're loved, fully accepted, fully approved, and fully pleasing to God. Yeah. Then when we're full of that, we accidentally go and love them. Yeah. And it's, it's a fruit. Yeah, and, and they see how we treat one another. I mean, y'all sang about that this morning. You know, it's that it's his love for us that causes us to be able to love one another. Right? We love because he first loved loved us. us. Last last verse before we take communion. uh, Ephesians six, and I didn't I didn't know this was in here honestly. I read it, so I know I have a promise about what? So what's the promise if I've read it? and It's going to bring it to my remembrance. So thank God He did that this morning or last night, right? Because this is so cool. This is so cool. Ephesians chapter 6. Paul couldn't come to Ephesus. He he told them, he'd already told them uh, when he met them. If you go back and read it in the book of Acts, he says, I'm never going to see your face again. Um... He said, after I leave, there's going to be people coming that's going to try to mess up what I've said and try to take you back into the bondage of religion. He called them, he called them ravaging dogs because they're going to take away the liberty you have in the message of Christ and try to put a yoke of bondage of what you could never satisfy anyway back on your neck. Um, and so, anyway, he, he's writing back to them because... By this time, Timothy was the pastor of Ephesus at Ephesus, and 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 there was a lot of good. There's a lot of good stuff that was going on here, but he wants to make it even better. So in verse 22 of 21, I'm sending you a dear friend. I don't have any idea how to pronounce that in the Greek. There's a tick in us. Is that what it says? There's a tick in us. Okay. Well, you get the you get the message. Uh, yeah. 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 That's what I would call him too. <laughs> but his word, his name, really means child of fortune or fortunate son. You know what? I when I heard that, I'm I'm a I'm a I'm a Vietnam War. Yeah, that's his first thing. Credence Clear Clearwater Revival, yeah. right? I'm not a fortunate son. Well, see, what a terrible thing to say. He sang a whole song about it. You know, Fogarty wrote that message, that song in 20 minutes. Guess who he was writing it about? 
but it's two specifically. One was the uh, David Eisenhower had just married uh, Julie Nixon in the White House in 1968. And, of course, he was in the Navy, but nowhere close to Vietnam. He was over in the Mediterranean somewhere. So that, it was that whole thing that, that led to him talking about the fortunate son. But thank God, aren't we? Now, see, we're the fortunate son. Yes, we are. Because we're in the fortunate. We're in the son of fortune. We're in the Amen. one that has it all. Yeah. And now we're in him. My rabbit trails, I'm sorry. But <laughs> I thought it was kind of a neat, neat story. Uh, it's, a pretty, it's a pretty good song, but now we know the... The fact that he was confused. He just he didn't know the gospel, did he? No. Okay. Because uh, we can all be fortunate sons. Because uh, Jesus was a soldier of fortune, right? He came and rescued us. Okay. But look what he says here. He is a beloved brother and trustworthy minister, which means what? if he's a trustworthy minister, what is he ministering? The ministry of reconciliation, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses. The world needs to know God's not mad at them, and he's not imputing their trespasses to them. There's only one sin left in the world, and it's unbelief in the gospel. So we're, the church has got to wake up, and that's what next week is about, the fullness that's prophesied. And it's going to happen, and it's going to happen through the church. Aren't you glad to be part of it? Yes. It's, ha- it's going to happen, be happening in our day. Uh, he will share with you all the concerns that I have for your welfare, and he will inform you of how I'm getting along. This is the part I never, I didn't, I've never seen this before. And he will what? Prophesy. He will also prophesy over you to encourage your hearts. Now notice the footnote. This is translated from the Aramaic. Aramaic. Prophesy... Prophecy in the local church, and I said this, but I never saw it tied to this. Prophecy in the local church will always encourage, edify, and enlighten. If you look at, if you look at 1 Corinthians 14, verse 3, Paul said that. Prophecy is going to be edification, exhortation, and comfort. If it's, if it's condemning you, it's not the prophecy under the new covenant. Because we are, there's no longer condemnation in Christ, right? Why? Why is there no more condemnation? Because he, he got condemned in our place. You can't condemn two people for the same thing. That's not made to give you an excuse to do wrong. It's to made to enlighten you to the reality of how, you, how good and perfect you are in his eyes so that you won't feel shame and condemnation and guilt and then fail because you don't know who you are. See, it's, the, the grace bashers don't understand what they're doing to harm the message of grace. And I know y'all know. We haven't come to the mountain of Sinai. Sinai. 3,000 died, but Mount Zion, where... When the law was given, three, yeah. And see, they weren't supposed to stop at Mount Sinai. It's a seven-day journey. Seven days, a thousand years. You know, they're supposed to go straight on over to the promised land. But as all of us, if we get religion, you know, we get bogged down in the desert thinking that somehow I'm going to grow some peas beings out here in this desert how can you do that there's no water if without the holy spirit there's no water you can't grow anything inside here without him he's the one he's the reason for the fruit he's the water he's the well that comes out amen i'm preaching now i'm sorry uh but he will prophesy over you i love that that's the one thing paul wanted him to do when he got there was prophesy so what was he what what, when he when it says he's going to prophesy what does that mean yeah, by doing what? What's the spirit of all prophesy, prophecy? He's going to give them the glory of the Lord. He's going to tell them what Jesus has done for them. Don't you know that you're a temple of the Holy Spirit? Don't you know that Jesus made it us into the Holy... See, everything that he was prophesying was about Jesus and what Jesus did for them. And that's what was going to make them, their hearts encouraged. And that's what hopefully today is encouraging our hearts is... This is prophecy about what Jesus has done. Amen? Okay, hallelujah. Let's take communion together this morning. I haven't even been watching the notes here. Andrew Farley says, God is not... What, what does that say? Mad. mad. He's, not even in a bad mood. He's not even in a bad mood. <laughs> well, that's, that's, pretty, that's pretty good. Yeah. 
Corinthians was 513. 2 Corinthians 513 is where exist to me. You know, exist to me is that's the ecstasy, is he exists to me. Uh, permanently, he's not there one minute and gone the next minute, depending on my actions. He is uh, in me permanently and forever, and he's a well of, by his spirit, a well of water that's bubbling up to give me the joy of, of my salvation in Christ and to give me the ministry of reconciliation to bring others to the understanding that God loves them. And he gave his son for them to prove it. That's the proof of God's love is he didn't spare his own son, and he could have. He could have said, oh, yeah, the hell with yeah. But he didn't. He sent his son. And that was the proof of his love. And, it, and he goes on to say in Romans 8, if he didn't spare his own son, he's not going to spare, and that there's nothing else he'll withhold from us. Nothing. Okay. I, I just I felt a change of course. I was going to do something, but now I'm not. Has that ever happened before? Okay. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 11. I'm going to say this because I think it's important for people who might be watching to understand. I, this, God, God help us. I grew up putting myself under a curse every time I took communion. And it says here in uh, uh, in, ch in verse in chapter 11, uh, verse 27 says, "For this reason, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in the wrong spirit will be guilty of dishonoring the body and blood of the Lord." So let each individual find, first evaluate his own attitude, and only then eat the bread and drink the cup. For continually eating and drinking with a wrong spirit, uh, and if you see that unworthily is what the footnote says, will bring judgment upon yourself by not recognizing the body. What does that mean, doing, eating it unworthily? Looking at yourself. Thinking, you know, well, I'm not really good enough to do this. What makes us good enough? Christ. Exactly. Christ. Exactly. Christ. exactly. And that's all Paul's saying here. Examine yourself. Is your faith in his body and his blood and his life? Or is it in your performance? You see how our performance is what can get us back into trouble? If we're trying to say, Lord, you know, I know I messed up this week, but Father, forgive me because, you know, I'm not going to ever do it again. And then now that makes me right and ready now to be able to take communion. See, that's the silliness of what most of the church is doing today is they're they're saying well i better not I, I used to let the communion pass pass by sometimes for this very thing because i wasn't enjoying what he did for me i was too worried about what i was doing that may have made him mad or angry or whatever with me you'll see that yeah. uh, and, and 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 i'll tell you this is the reason he says this is the, the reason why many of you are weak chronically ill and some even dying prematurely is because you're doing this you're condemning yourself Instead of honoring him, this is to honor him, and what that what he has done for us and in us, <laughs> and that's that's the 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 source. His body is the source of my wholeness, because he took all. Everywhere Jesus went, 
and you can read this in Galatians 3, he sucked up, he sucked in everything that the devil, all the devil's business. He's just, you know, he said, I came to destroy the works of the devil. He goes back to the cross. Amen. Well, hey, yeah, absolutely. But what I'm saying is there's an application for us today. If we're not careful, we'll go back and start examining ourselves of how good we are and whether we deserve to take this or how good he is and we deserve because he has given us his grace. Amen. So thank you, Lord, for your body. We just thank you that we can... You said, eat this until you're satisfied. I'm not satisfied. I'm going to eat this until I'm satisfied that I've been... that I've experienced everything that He paid to give me. That's, that's when I'll say, okay, I'm satisfied. Until then, thank you, Lord, for your body. Thank you for what you did for us with your body to take our place and to give us your life by taking our death. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And this, this cup, this blood seals the new covenant. The new covenant was between who? The Father and the Son. The Father and the Son. The Son, Jesus was the Son of Man. And He put on flesh so that He could represent man. But He was a perfect man. And he's, he represented fallen man. So he put away everything in fallen man so he could give us the perfectness, perfection of his life. So thank you for sealing us. This was a covenant between Lord, between you and your, fa your father. And you included us in. You included us. You, you were the, you're the representative man for all of us now. And you've included us in this glorious gospel and given us new life by your blood that is forever and forever sealed. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, I only went ten over today, so I see all I see all the messages, and I'm, I appreciate. It. I'll look at them later. And Mary, for those again, we're we're going to have a Christmas party. I think y'all weren't here last week, but church church will pay, take care of this. But um, at save the date uh, Sunday uh, the eighteenth. Y'all, y'all remember it better than I'm. Uh, Sunday, it's good food. yeah. Just, just mention salt grass, and everybody's ears go. So, uh, we're gonna have a, we're gonna have our uh, Christmas party, a church Christmas party at Salt Grass at 12:30, right after the message. Uh, so, we're everybody's welcome. You're gonna come, you come back, back down from Indiana. Everybody, it's, it's all covered. But you know, we're, we'll, we'll, and I, for those I know, Zach and several others are not able to come much. Mary. We'd love it if y'all got to come in. And also, I think we can probably arrange a pretty good rate at the hotel here if you just let us know. Um, Jeremiah Johnson will be here December the 4th. Uh, and so, is that everything? Uh, we won't be, it's, Christmas is on sun, uh, Sunday this year, so we won't have Christmas. I think Donna's going to be here just in case. Uh, yeah. Uh, just in case somebody shows up. Next Sunkiss meeting will be November 10th. November 10th is it's the next Sunkiss. November 3rd. So we're taking a three week break. Okay. So it's November 10th so for our final chapter on I3. Well, Anna, it's good to see you. I see some faces. I don't. I'm sorry if I haven't identified everybody. I, see, I think I saw Susan and Wayne on, and, um, and we're. We're just so grateful. If anybody has the opportunity to be here around Christmas, around the 18th, love to have you join us at the Saltgrass. Love y'all, and I hope you have a great week. We're going to do part three, the last. Uh, In this portion of if, if this if this portion, but related to the glory, the the the, the prophecy of the glory of God. Love y'all. Uh, November 10th. Okay. Mary Colbert said, okay, that's, that's Deborah's meeting and love y'all.